my name is Dana Leafers and I am a PGY2 ambulatory care pharmacy resident and today we are going to be talking about the pathophysiology of diabetes. During my presentation I'm going to be using several acronyms as you can see on the slide. Um, so just to point out a couple, FFA means free fatty acids, GIP is glucose dependent insulin trophic polypeptide, IAPP, isolate amyloid polypeptide or amylin, IGT, impaired glucose tolerance, NGT, normal glucose tolerance, and OGTT is oral glucose tolerance test. So the role of autoimmunity in the pathogenesis of type 1 diabetes created that the assumption that type 1 and type 2 diabetes possessed unique etiologies, disease courses, and consequently treatment approaches. But instead, we really need to be thinking about diabetes as an overlapping system. Patients presenting with classic insulin resistance associated type 2 diabetes may display hallmarks of type 1 diabetes. Similarly, obesity-related insulin resistant may be observed in patients presenting with textbook type 1 diabetes. And then there is latent autoimmune diabetes, or LADA, LADA, in adults. This phenotype carries a lot of controversy. Does LADA constitute a form of type 2 diabetes with earlier fast destruction of beta cells? a late manifestation of type 1 diabetes, or a distinct entity with its own genetic footprint. The use of insulin resistant to define type 2 diabetes may also need some work. Many obese patients with insulin resistance do not develop diabetes, which indicates that insulin resistance is insufficient to cause type 2 diabetes without predisposing factors that affect beta cell function. So instead of thinking about type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes into bucket categories, we really need to start thinking of diabetes as a spectrum. And if you're asking yourself, well, why does this all matter anyway? Well, if you think about how we treat diabetes type 1 and how we treat diabetes type 2, they are completely different. So classification is going to affect your treatment, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but on the same hand, it may not always be 100% correct. So patients diagnosed with LADA who retain endogenous insulin production may receive default insulin when other treatment options with less ADRs potentially could be utilized. So it has been proposed that the choice of therapy should be based on particular mediating pathways of hyperglycemia present in each individual patient as this will provide a broader use of existing agents to the management of maturity onset diabetes of the young, as well as stress-related and steroid-induced diabetes. So we are going to talk about the 11 contributing factors that leads to the development of diabetes. So diabetes was first thought to be caused by three main issues, beta cell failure and insulin resistance in the muscles and livers. The first and most important that we will discuss is the beta cell failure. Beta cells, as you may know, are found in the pancreas. The pancreas was actually named for the Greek words pan for all and creus for flesh. And it's a 15 centimeter long J-shaped, almost like a hockey stick, soft lobulated organ. It lies transversely on the posterior abdominal wall behind the stomach and across the lumbar spine, L1 and L2. Almost all of the pancreas, 95%, consists of exocrine tissue that produces pancreatic enzymes for digestion. Under simulation of secretin and CCK, the zymogenic cells secrete a variety of enzymes, such as tricepsin, which digests protein, lipase, which digests fats, amylase, which digests carbohydrates, and many others. Ductular cells also produce bicarbonate, which makes the pancreatic fluid, or juice, alkaline. But what we're going to focus on is going to be the remaining tissue consisting of endocrine cells. 
Scattered throughout the gland are pancreatic clusters called islets of Lagerhans. These clusters of cells almost look like grapes and produce hormones that regulate blood sugar and regulate pancreatic secretions. Islets constitute only about 2% of the pancreas. Now, islets of Lagerhans contain alpha cells, which is about 20% of the islets that secrete glucagon, and beta cells, which is about 75% of the islets that secrete insulin. Beta cells also secrete islet amyloid polypeptide IAPP, or amylin, which is a regulatory peptide where it inhibits insulin and glucagon secretion and at distant targets. It has binding sites in the brain, possibly contributing to hunger regulation and inhibiting gastric emptying. Now, this is not to be confused with GLP-1, which is secreted from the gut and can increase the insulin secretion from the beta cells. Both amylin and GLP-1 are released after meals and can improve glucose metabolism. They both decrease food intake and body weight via effects on the brain, and GLP-1 also acts on the vagus nerve. Beta cell failure is thought to arise from multiple aspects, with the first being advancing age, which is consistent with the observation that the incidence of diabetes increases progressively with advancing age. Genome-wide association studies of single nucleotide polymorphisms have identified a number of genetic variants that are associated with beta cell function. Over 40 independent loci demonstrating an association with an increased risk for type 2 diabetes has been shown. Just one example includes the high mobility group A1 protein that is a key regulator of the insulin receptor gene. Functional variants are associated with an increased risk of diabetes. Insulin resistance by placing an increased demand on the beta cell to hypersecrete insulin also plays an important role. The precise mechanism where which insulin resistant leads to beta cell failure still remains unknown. It's commonly stated that the beta cell, by being forced to continuously hypersecrete insulin, eventually wears out. But an alternate hypothesis is that the cause of the insulin resistance is also directly responsible for the beta cell failure, which basically means that the excess deposition of fat leads to elevated plasma-free fatty acid levels, which have been shown to be toxic. The fatty acids then impair insulin secretion. This process is referred to as lipotoxicity, which would explain why interventions such as weight loss that mobilize fat out of the beta cell would be expected to reverse lipotoxicity and preserve function. In vitro studies with isolated human isolates have demonstrated that chronic exposure to elevated plasma glucose levels impairs insulin secretion, and this has been referred to as glucotoxicity. Now, we talked about IAPP on the previous slide, and it was actually discovered through its ability to aggregate into pancreatic isolate amyloid deposits. Aggregated IAPP has cytotoxic properties and is believed to be of critical importance in the loss of beta cells. There is actually a study performed in baboons that showed as the relative amyloid area of the pancreatic isolates increased from 5 to 51 percent, there is a progressive decline in the beta cell function in insulin sensitivity which was strongly correlated with the increase in fasting plasma glucose concentration, which we will talk more about this in an upcoming slide. Now let's move on to the second player in diabetes, the liver. The brain has an obligate need for glucose and is responsible for 50% of glucose utilization under basal or fasting conditions. This glucose demand is met primarily by glucose production by the liver and to a smaller extent the kidneys. Following an overnight fast, the liver of non-diabetic individuals produces glucose at the rate of 2 mg per kg per minute. Now in type 2 diabetes, the rate of basal hepatic glucose production is increased, averaging about 2.5 mg per kg per minute. Now that may not sound like a whole lot, but an average 80 kg person this amounts to be an addition of an extra 25 to 30 grams of glucose to the systemic circulation every night. The increase in basal glucose production is explained entirely by an increase in hepatic glucogeogenesis.
multiple other factors contribute to the accelerated rate of hepatic glucose production, including increased circulating glucagon levels and enhanced hepatic sensitivity to glucagon, lipotoxicity leading to increased expression and activity of the rate-limiting enzymes for glucogeogenesis, and glucotoxicity leading to increased expression and activity of the glucose 6-phosphatase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme for the glucose to escape from the liver. This overproduction of glucose by the liver occurs even in the presence of fasting plasma insulin levels that are increased two and a half to threefold, indicating severe resistance to the suppressive effect of insulin on hepatic glucose production. Muscle insulin resistance is another important player that could account for over 85 to 90 percent of the impairment glucose disposal, which can be explained by the presence of multiple intramyocellular defects in insulin action, including impaired glucose transport and phosphorylation, reduced glycogen synthesis, and decreased glucose oxidation. However, more proximal defects in the insulin signal transduction system play a paramount role in the muscle insulin resistance. So for insulin to work, it must first bind to and then activate the insulin receptor by phosphorylating the key tyrosine residues on the chain. This results in the translocation of the insulin receptor substrate, which is the IRS1, to the plasma membrane, where it interacts with the insulin receptor and also undergoes tyrosine phosphorylation. This leads to the activation of PI3 kinase and AKT, resulting in glucose transport into the cell. Activation of nitric oxide synthesis with arterial vasodilation and stimulation of multiple intracellular metabolic processes. So in patients with diabetes, the ability of insulin to phosphorylate IRS1 was severely impaired. This defect in insulin signaling leads to decreased glucose transport, impaired release of nitric oxide with endothelial dysfunction, and multiple defects in intramyocellular glucose metabolism. In contrast to the severe defect in IRS1 activation, the mitogen-activated protein, or MAP, MAP kinase pathway, is normally responsive to insulin. The MAP kinase pathway, when stimulated, leads to the activation of a number of intracellular pathways involved in inflammation, cellular proliferation, and atherosclerosis. Thus, the block at the level of IRS1 impairs glucose transport into the cell, and the resultant hyperglycemia stimulates insulin secretion. Because the MAP kinase pathway retains its sensitivity to insulin, this causes excessive stimulation of this pathway and activation of multiple intracellular pathways involved in inflammation and atherogenesis. This, in part, explains the strong association between insulin resistant and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in non-diabetic as well as in type 2 diabetic individuals. Although insulin resistant in liver and muscle are well established, type 2 diabetes does not occur in the absence of progressive beta cell failure. Transitioning, in 2009, they came out with the ominous octet, which added an additional five key players to the pathogenesis of diabetes. Fat cells are resistant to insulin's antilipolytic effect, leading to all-day-long elevation in the plasma FFA concentration. Chronically increased plasma FFA stimulates glucogeogenesis and impairs insulin secretion, which is the lipotoxicity that we talked about earlier. Physiological elevation in the plasma FFA concentration stimulates hepatic glucose production and impairs insulin-stimulated glucose uptake in liver and muscle, which leads to the nickname the disharmonous quartet. Dysfunctional fat cells also produce excessive amounts of insulin resistance inducing inflammatory and atherosclerotic provoking adipocytokines and fail to secrete normal amounts of insulin sensitivity adipocytokines. When adipocyte storage capacity is exceeded, 
lipid overflows into the muscle, liver, and cells, causing muscle and hepatic insulin resistance. Lipids can also overflow into the arterial vascular smooth cell, leading to acceleration of atherosclerosis. This visual shows the ability of insulin to suppress the plasma FFA concentration. Inhibition of FFA turnover is significantly impaired compared with normal glucose tolerant control subjects to type 2 patients with diabetes at all plasma insulin concentrations. Glucose ingestion through the GI tract will elicit a much greater insulin response than an IV glucose infusion, and this can be explained by the incretin effect. GLP-1 and GIP account for 90% of this effect. GLP-1 is secreted by the L cells of the distal small intestines. A deficiency of GLP-1 can be observed in individuals with IGT and worsens progressively with progression to type 2 diabetes. There is also a resistance to the stimulatory effect of GLP-1 on insulin secretion. GLP-1 is also a potent inhibitor of glucagon secretion, and the lack of GLP-1 contributes to the paradoxical rise in plasma glucagon secretion and impairs suppression of hepatic glucose production that occurs after ingestion of a mixed meal. Now, GIP is secreted by the K cells of the proximal small intestine, and production is actually increased, but there is resistance to the stimulatory effect of GIP on insulin secretion. So in contrast to GLP-1, plasma levels of GIP are elevated in type 2 diabetes, yet circulating plasma insulin levels are reduced, which suggests resistance to the stimulatory effect of GIP on insulin secretion. Studies have shown that tight glycemic control can restore the beta cell's insulin secretory response to GIP. Thus, beta cell resistant to GIP is another manifestation of glucotoxicity. The sixth member who established the cetaceous sextet is the pancreatic alpha cell, which increases glucagon secretion and enhances hepatic sensitivity to glucagon, leading to increased basal hepatic glucose production and impaired hepatic glucose production suppression by insulin, which ultimately elevates the fasting plasma glucagon levels. The subtidal septet includes the kidney. The kidney normally will filter 162 grams of glucose every day. 90% of this filtered glucose is reabsorbed by the high capacity of the SGLT2 transporter in the convoluted segment of the proximal tubule, and the remaining 10% of the filtered glucose is reabsorbed by the SGLT1 transporter in the straight segment of the descending proximal tubule. The result is that no glucose appears in the urine. Cultured human proximal renal tubular cells from type 2 diabetic patients demonstrated markedly increased levels of SGLT2. Thus, an adaptive response by the kidney to conserve glucose, which is essential to meet the energy demands of the body, becomes maladaptive in the diabetic patient. Instead of dumping glucose in the urine to correct the hyperglycemia, the kidney chooses to hold on to the glucose. The hypothalamus plays a central role in the regulation of energy intake and feeding behavior. This leads us to our eighth member, the ominous octet, the brain. One study used functional MRI imaging to monitor hypothalamic function after oral glucose intake. The 10 obese and 10 lean patients with NGT ingested 75 grams of glucose while a midsagittal slice of the hypothalamus was continuously imaged for 50 minutes. After glucose ingestion, lean subjects demonstrated an inhibition of the fMRI signal in the areas corresponding to the paraventricular and ventromedial nuclei. Now in the B subjects, this inhibitory response was markedly attenuated and delayed compared with that observed in lean subjects. The time taken to reach the maximum inhibitory response correlated with the fasting plasma glucose and insulin concentrations in both lean and obese subjects. So the basic breakdown, insulin is an appetite suppressant. Food increased in obese despite hyperinsulinemia. Theoretically, 
Is the brain resistant to insulin? Potentially. In 2016, Stanley Schwartz published an article called the Beta Self-Centric Classification Schema, which built upon the ominous octet, and it added three key players and dubbed this as the Regis 11. So the mediating pathways of hyperglycemia that contribute to beta cell dysfunction include liver, muscle, and adipose tissue, and brain. The first new addition includes systemic low-grade inflammation as it is observed in all subtypes of diabetes and has been shown to accompany the endoplasmic stress imposed by increased metabolic demand for insulin. There is some preliminary evidence that increase-based treatments may have anti-inflammatory effects. Whether other pharmacological agents, either currently on the market or new molecular entities, can provide beneficial in treating the low-grade inflammation and immune dysregulation observed in patients with diabetes is an important area for research. The tenth addition is the gut microbiota. Changes in the gut microbiome has been associated with the development of diabetes and obesity, and potentially explains why only some overweight individuals develop diabetes while others do not. Again, this is an emerging area of research which warrants further investigation. And then the last member is decreased amylin production. Reductions in amylin are a consequence of beta cell dysfunction. Decreased amylin levels lead to accelerated gastric emptying and increased glucose absorption in the small intestine with corresponding increases in postprandial glucose levels. The mediating pathways of hyperglycemia that contribute to beta cell dysfunction are shown on the slide. The liver, muscle, adipose tissue, brain, colon, and immune dysregulation are damaged and results in downstream hyperglycemia arising from increased glucagon secretion, as well as a reduction in insulin production and cretin effect in amylin levels. Even mild hyperglycemia resulting from beta cell dysfunction can upregulate HGLT2 protein in the kidney, which further contributes to hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, regardless of its source, leads to glucotoxicity, which further impairs beta cell function. In a given patient, the specific mediating pathways of hyperglycemia at work are variable, though likely to involve multiple pathways. The next image shows a picture of where all the medications for type 2 diabetes work. So you can see for insulin resistance, the liver, muscle, and adipose tissue. Metformin, TZDs, target these organs. Also for the brain, incretins, dopamine agonists, or appetite suppressants will target that organ. SGLT2s for the kidney, GLP1s, cramatide for the stomach and small intestines. And for the immune dysregulation or inflammation, you also have incretins and anti-inflammatories. As well for your colon, it includes the probiotics, incretins, metformin. And for the pancreatic beta cells, you have incretins as well. The underlying theme for the Regis 11 is that clinicians should be recommending the least number of agents which target the greatest number of mediating pathways present in the specific patient case while minimizing hypoglycemia and weight gain. Also, the Regis 11 paper strongly suggests avoiding sulfonylureas and clinides. The benefit of their low cost is outweighed by their risk, including hypoglycemia, weight gain, potential for beta cell exhaustion, increased risk of cardiovascular events, and high rate of treatment failure. So fonduries have been shown to induce the apoptosis of beta cells in culture. And then lastly, the author states that the, when insulin therapy is needed, consider it as an add-on therapy rather than a substitution. When patients start basal bolus insulin therapy, many clinicians stop all oral agents, including metformin, due to a perception that, is, that it is ineffective if the A1C has started to climb, despite the multiple benefits associated with metformin beyond glycemic control. This new paradigm includes a call to clinicians to consider continuing previous treatment when starting insulin therapy and vice versa, and adding agents to insulin when appropriate. So again, this is all further research that needs to be investigated, but it is still good to keep in mind.